Today, I'm very excited to introduce our very first Talent Tuesday speaker, Mark Nesbitt from Nesbitt Training, to talk about leadership and retention. As a respected authority in the construction industry, Mark has accumulated over 30 years of valuable knowledge, experience, and leadership. As general manager of Corey Operations for one of the top aggregate production co companies in Ontario, he played a vital role in the recruitment, training, and promotion of numerous employees to operate safe, successful operations. Mark is passionate about creating a team of people who are dedicated inspired and driven towards personal success as well as company goals. As a natural teacher, he takes great pride in helping motivated individuals achieve their own extraordinary success. Fellow colleagues who have worked alongside Mark can attest to his down-to-earth personality, trustworthiness, and approachable demeanor. Through over 15 years as a student of John Maxwell's teachings, Mark has harnessed a wealth of knowledge that equips him with the tools necessary to help others achieve their best. Following the words of John Maxwell, if you want to grow your company, grow your people. Please welcome Mark Nesbitt. Hello, how is everybody? I'm glad you're here. Uh, first of all, I want to actually thank Concrete Alberta for asking me to uh, you know, participate with, with such a, a group of what I would consider industry professionals. Uh, I, I think one of the things that I really want to point out is that I, I'm really personally proud of what Concrete uh, Alberta and the rest of the associations are doing uh, you know, to, to, to try and, we'll say, at least focus on this problem and to try and uh, see what we can do to make it better. Because let's just say it, I'm, I'm proud of the fact you've grabbed the bull by the horns and you want to fix it. Um, you know, the thing is, is, there's a lot of companies and a lot of associations not talking about it. Uh, however, not a whole lot are really uh, taking action like what you are. So I'm quite proud of that fact. And, and just to kind of give an example, like I personally, think that, you know, the subject that I'm going to share my thoughts on is a very, uh, it's a critical subject. And I, I think it's actually, it's a, it, it's hindering every company. Uh, I, I work, we'll say mostly in Ontario. However, I, you know, I, I watch through, through social media, I, I watch all over North America. And then, you know, the interesting thing is, is that I don't know of a company out there that um, you know isn't facing some sort of a problem with people. Now, I I work for with a couple of companies actually who have enough people, and I, I know some of the things they're doing, and I'm going to you know share some of them with you. But at the same time, you know you you can't go to the grocery store without seeing a help wanted sign. And to show you how serious it is, is that you know I I, I think from last I heard, according to the screen, there's 11 participants. And that's great. And, and you 11, obviously, you're the rock stars. That's why you're here. But in order to fix this problem, there should be 1,100 participants. And you know, this is why I say that, you know, Concrete Alberta is actually doing something. So uh, thank you for having me as, as being the first uh, speaker in, in the series. And, of course, I'm going to try my best to share, you know, some of my thoughts, we'll say, on recruiting and, of course, retaining people. And, and some of this stuff will say is a lot easier to talk about than it is to do, uh, like anything. And I'm going to share, first of all, some of the things that I've seen uh, over the years uh, that I think help with recruiting. Uh, but for, first of all, we got to somewhat face facts here. And that is that, you know, as Dan mentioned, I've been in this industry for a long time. Okay? I'm, I'm obviously in my late 50s. And I can remember, we'll say, when, you know, when Archie Bunker was the show that everybody watched on TV. And I, I shared this picture, I remember the first time to a group of people I worked with at a precast plant. And one of the gentlemen there said that, you know, his dad used to watch that show so we could feel normal. And, and I remember when Archie Bunker was on TV, I'd never heard of the word empathy. And, and we've literally gone from, you know, Archie Bunker to Billy Porter, just in my lifetime. And I'm not taking either one of the inventories. I'm just kind of pointing out how, how things have changed. And, and of course, you know, as leaders, as, as industry professionals, we, of course, have to change with the times. I honestly believe that, you know, we, not, we, we cannot become who we need to be uh, by remaining who we are. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've often seen is, um, you know, what happens, you know, we'll say when the company outgrows the people. I've often seen that where a company grows and, and it gets bigger and bigger and the current leaders, 
uh, you know, then their current thinking isn't sufficient. And again, sometimes you got to ask the question, what happens when the position outgrows a leader? And I've often seen that too. But I, I want to share with you one thing. In some of the stuff, I'm going to try and keep as simple as I can because I'm a simple type of guy. You know, my life changed literally the day I stopped listening to music and started to listen to audiobooks. It's kind of that simple. Uh, like right now, I think on my phone, I've got over 300 audiobooks, and it, I just I keep learning. And I think that's important. And, and, you know, us as leaders, when we're trying to do what we have to do, you know, we have to keep learning and trying to grow and, and, and see what everybody else is doing because, you know, success leaves clues. And I really believe that, you know, we can learn from what others do. And I'm going to share some of these secrets today. Uh, you know, I, I just want to point out, you know, who doesn't love chicken wings? I, like I said, I try to keep it simple. Am I here to talk? Lawyer talk. And, you know, the interesting thing is you may hear something today you're not really um, maybe out in favor with. But that being said, uh, you know, you eat the meat and leave the bones and you can decide what you want to keep. But I encourage you, you know, to keep an open mind and, uh, you know, and just to see how it could apply to you and some of the stuff that we can learn. Uh, you know, it's, I, I'm a kind of an Apple guy, and, and I just want to share with you, I have this laptop that I use when I do training on site. And the interesting thing is, is that this is my second one that I've had in, I guess, 10 years. And the, the reason I want to share the story is that this second laptop I bought gave me a lot of grief. I would show up to do some training at places, and of course, it would freeze up and then I couldn't do my training. And it got to the point where I actually called Apple and said, I want either my money back, I want to trade this thing in, you know, the, the, this has embarrassed me enough, I can't go on. So they were very good about it. And they said, well, you just bring it in, we'll have a look at it. Now, I, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. I'm used to working with equipment. I took it in and they phoned me within a day and they said, come and get your computer. And I said, well, what did you do to it? Did you change a part? And they said, no, we never changed any parts. They said, all we did is we updated the operating system. And the reason I share this with you is that computer has worked almost, you know, perfect since. And, and, and the thing is, is all they change is the operating system. And if, if we can look at what we do in the same terms, you know, if we can change our operating system and, and, and maybe try something different, I think it's going to go a long ways. And, you know, th th there isn't a company out there that isn't, you know, you know, we all will buy equipment, we buy ready mix trucks, you buy loaders, you buy, you know, everything we need is equipment. But at the same time, not every company will say is um, uh, as, as good maybe at it as, as buying the soft skills for their people, you know, investing in the team, because, you know, the, the, of course, you know, the more you grow your people, the more your company is going to grow. And I just, I, I, I'm going to, some of the stuff I might repeat a couple of times, but it, it, it's so important that I repeat it so, you know, that hopefully that you remember, because I know I have a hard time remembering things, but, you know, systems create behaviors. And, and if we put some systems in place and try to follow the systems, uh, you know, I think we're, we're going to gain a lot. You know, the thing is, is that I got to ask the question, like, why are you here? And why are so many people, you know, did they decide not to be here today? Because, you know, a funny thing is, is that everybody wants to eat and sleep indoors, yet nobody wants to build the houses. You know, nobody wants to dig the ditches. Nobody wants to do that trickle work. Nobody wants to do the roofing. Uh, you know, the, every doctor, you know, needs a plumber. You know, every lawyer needs a mechanic. And, and yet at the same time, we struggle to attract people. Uh, you know, I, I heard on a podcast here long ago, the guy says, you know, you can't eat Twitter. You know, Facebook won't build a car and Google Home won't build a house. And the reason I point this out is there, there's such a, uh, I think, a, such an emphasis on, we'll call it, um, you know, some of these tech jobs. i got to remember, I live in Ottawa, but Canada is supposed to be the high tech capital of Canada. And there's such an emphasis on tech jobs that people have forgotten about the blue collar workers. And, and not only that is that I, I don't know that they get appreciated as much as they should. Uh, you know, sometimes when I do training, I actually I'll go for a run during the day and I'll see people doing a landscape or even people picking up the garbage. And I, and I always run by them and say, hey, look, you know, Canada needs more of you. And I'm not so certain that, you know, we recognize or appreciate, you know, them as much as we should sometimes. I, I think there's a very distinct uh, difference in some of the people we work with and, and we got to look at them in a different way too. There's, you know, there's those who take the shower before work versus the ones that take the shower after work. Uh, my experience has been as I work with a lot of uh, HR professionals, uh, sometimes HR professionals will say aren't very fluent in blue collar language. 
And, you know, that being says, you know, we have to learn to work with them a little bit more. And of course, you know, to be attracted to them, you know, to, to be able to attract them, we should say. But, you know, one of the things that we have to do, obviously, we've got to recruit the people. And that sometimes can be very challenging. Uh, I, I do believe there's a lot of things we can do, uh, you know, to, to to recruit. I know I'm going to share with you some of the stuff that I've seen, uh, some of the stuff that I've saw work, some that hasn't worked. And, you know, social media is a big one. You know, there's one company here in uh, not too far in Ottawa. And let's just say it's not a very big company. They might have maybe 20 people uh, max. And the interesting part of this is the owner of the company is now the host of the Con Expo podcast. And he's very active on Instagram. Like he's one of these, what you call it, influencers. And, you know, when you talk to him, he's got like almost an endless supply of people wanting to work for him because of who he is on social media. And I really believe that's something that we need, you know, to consider because, uh, you know, one of the things I think we can really do to gain a lot is, and I encourage the companies I work with to do this, is, you know, take a picture of your team, post it on social media. And of course, then the team gets to go home and show their kids and they can kind of do a little bit of bragging. So I think social media is a big one. And that's why I put it first. And I'm not sure that every company is, um, you know, using that to the best of their ability. I, I really believe that there's a lot of schools. Like I remember when I was, let's say, in high school, I had no desire to go to university or college, and I, I just wanted to get out and work. And I know that there are people like that there today. And you know, some of the more, I know what I've seen or experienced more so is the rural schools. I think that we have a better advantage of doing that. So when you have, you know, when you have these job fairs at these schools, I think we can gain a lot there. Uh, hunting, I, 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 you know, if there's any deer hunters in the group, uh, you know, well, one of the things, if you're going to go hunting deer, you, you just can't do it in your backyard. You have to go look for, you know, the deer. And I want to share a story with you. A friend of mine, he used to be the general manager of a Moxie's restaurant here in Ottawa. And one day I just asked him, I said, well, where do you get your servers from? And he said, I'll give you an example. He said, I was at the Aldo Shoe Store at the shopping center. And he said, this young lady, uh, you know, sold me a pair of shoes. He said she was friendly. She was witty. She had everything that we look for in, in you know, in a, in a Moxie's employee. And, of course, he said, I gave her my card and said, if you know, if, if you ever want a job at Moxie's, let me know. And coincidentally, this lady also will say she knew that she could make more money at Moxie's than she could at all those shoes. So you, you, you can bet yourself she took him up on his offer. We can do the same thing. You know, you, you go to Home Depot or you you see some kid that's working hard. Like, don't be afraid to give them your card and say, hey, look, you know, you, you look like a real good hard worker. If you ever want a job, you know, don't be afraid to give me a call because uh, and I think we can do more of that. One of the things, too, is, is the company website. Um, I work with one company in particular, we'll say, who is really having a hard time attracting people. And if, if you look at their company website, it, it's painful to get on there and fill out an application or look for a job. Because like I say, you know, the people who will say take a shower after work, sometimes they're not very affluent on the computers. You know, they, they're not really, you know, maybe affluent something or but they're just they're not computer savvy for the most part. And it's got to be kept simple. And so your website obviously is, is a, you know, a, a good one. You know, referrals and incentives. You know, there are a lot of companies that I'm not sure exactly what it's like in your area, but a lot of companies in, in my area where, you know, if, you, if if I'm there and I bring in an employee, they'll give me a couple hundred dollars the day the person starts. And once they're there three months, they'll give them another couple hundred dollars. And I think there's a lot to be gained by doing that. And of course, there's government agencies. I know that, um, you know, some of the government agencies have people that, you know, actually want to go to work. Uh, a lot of them will say in Ottawa here tend to be more so immigrants. And from what I've seen, most of them are good workers. So I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, you know, bat an eye giving them a job. I just, you know, Indeed is another one I, I forgot to mention. So just for what it's worth, I, I kind of looked at this. I, I took a couple of screenshots of some Indeed ads the other day. And like these ads, you know, if 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 you're gonna, we'll say, fight for good people, you want to have an ad that we'll say is very appealing. You know, just looking for two 
you know, concrete farmers killed laborers to assist on a large bore. That's all fine and dandy. I don't see a future in that ad. And I know that, you know, with these ads, you're somewhat limited as to what you can put in. But I really believe, though, when we put stuff in there, you know, we have to be different than somebody else if we want to attract. Because if, if there's 100 ads and they all read the same, you know, all they're going to look at is money. And, you know, I'm not so certain that those are the, you know, the, the ideal employees. Of course, you know, I, I think, you know, again, where does it say in there that you're going to build skills, build a future, have a career with us? Like, you don't really see any of that. And, and I think there's a lot can be gained with our messaging. You know, the, the greatest threat to us is thinking that somebody else is going to do our jobs. You know, we are the ones that are have to look after the recruiting. Um, you know, we're the ones that have to do the hiring, we have to do the onboarding, you know, do, do the whole part of it. And the thing is, is that, you know, I think one of the things too is that, you know, the greatest contribution in this world we could ever make not be something we do, but it should be somebody that we raise or somebody that we train. And I think we need to keep that in mind that, you know, you know, as leaders, we go first. You know, it's up to us to make sure we go first and, and make the changes that we have to do and, and to try to get somebody in. And, you know, I, I, I kind of like using this picture of a used car salesman because from what I've seen with a lot of companies in particular, you know, the, when it comes to onboarding, they tend to, um, because of law, they, they quite often they'll bring somebody in and they'll do safety training first, you know, first day on the job. And I'm not so certain that that's, you know, the right message first hour, first 10 minutes on the job. I know that if I was to go and buy a car and if the salesman made me promise that, you know, I had to obey the rules of the road, you know, not to text and drive, you know, to wear my seatbelt, not to drink and drive before I bought the car, chances are I wouldn't buy a car off of them. So we got to just remember, you know, these, the people that come to work with us, you know, to join our team, we want to make sure that we treat them, you know, well the first day. And I think there's a lot we can be gained by doing that. I just don't want to share with you some of these companies, like I say, success leaves clues. And, you know, when you see some of these companies, what do they have in common? You know, you've got Disney, Accenture, Apple, uh, Nordstrom's, uh, the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, and of course, Chick-fil-A. And when you look at, you know, what, what these companies do, the first thing they do when they bring somebody on the job is they train them for culture. They teach them culture. They will spend, you know, I know for at Apple, for example, you go through a week of culture training before you get any hard skill training. Because it's important that they know who you are. Uh, and of course, it, and now that's how they become, you know, what the culture of your company is. And and if we think that, you know, those are maybe just blue collar jobs, or sorry, white collar jobs. I, I love showing a picture of a Ritchie Brothers sale. If you've ever been to a Ritchie Brothers sale, I've been to lots of them. You'll see that the equipment is lined up perfect. And that's just true Ritchies are. And of course, we want to try to have that same culture in our companies. Uh, though I, I can't emphasize enough, culture isn't something you see. But I'm going to mention that I really believe cultures are something, it's a bit like the wind. You can feel it. You can't see it, but you sure can feel it. And, you know, we attract who we are, not who we want. You know, if we want to attract better people, you know, we have to become more attractable. I was driving actually from Sudbury to Toronto, and I, I, I kind of came across this office here, and I'm not here to, to um, you know, to, I'm not here to pick on them. But the thing is, when you see a business like this, you know, let's just say, you know, sometimes it, it's not very, it's not, it's not a very attractable business, as you can see. You know, the Edmonton Oilers, for example, when was the last time you saw an ad anywhere, whether it be on TV or radio, uh, newspaper, for the Edmonton Oilers looking for players? You, you just don't see it. Now, that is because the best people want to work for the best people. And that's why, you know, if you get a team like the Edmonton Oilers, you know, that's why they can, uh, you know, they tend to attract good players. One of the things I think that's quite important when we hire people uh, and when we go to recruit them is, you know, where there is no vision, the people will perish. Uh, you know, the number thing, number one thing we want from our leader is clarity. You know, we, we want to know what are we doing, where are we going, where do I fit in? And if you've ever drove down a road, we'll say in the wintertime when there's a snow squall, and you can't see, you know, one of the first things you do, of course, is you slow down because you can't see, you don't know where you're going. 
But as soon as you drive through the snow squall and then the sun comes out and everything, hey, guess what? You can speed up again because you know where you're going. And this is why it's so important when we bring people out of the job that, that you know, we explain to them where they're going, what we see for them in the future, and, and um, you know, how they're going to fit in. And, you know, as leaders, our number one job is to paint a picture of hope. You know, we have to be, uh, you know, the ones that inspire hope. And the thing is, is, you know, the first and the last task of a leader is to keep the hope alive. And, and if you don't think maybe that's important, I'm just going to share a little story with you. You know, we, we've all heard of Michael Phelps, uh, 28 Olympic medals. I was actually listening to him one day at a podcast. And he was, uh, somebody asked him in the podcast, what was the day that changed your life? And Mike Phelps openly said that the day that changed his life was the day he met his coach. He said he met his, this, he met a person that actually believed in him. And he said, that's the, you know, what really changed my life, is that somebody believed in me. And, and, you, and, and at that time in Michael's life, he was, you know, let's just say he was a kind of a, uh, you know, a bit of a hell raiser and, you know, had a hard time in school. And, was, you know, the home was split up. So he needed that person to believe in him. So you can see what happened to Michael Phelps, you know, when somebody believed in him. I'm just going to skip that slide. People rarely remember what we said, but will always remember how we made them feel. And this is, you know, whether somebody comes in to apply for a job, you know, if we're in a leadership role and, and we're trying to, uh, you know, influence and do something they might not have done on their own, they're always going to remember how we made them feel. I was doing some work the other day at a precast plant, and one of the, I guess he's a he's an area manager there, and he told me that his son went in to apply for a job working in a um, a pizza restaurant. And he said, we went in to apply for this job, this the gentleman that owned the pizza restaurant actually had a pen in his hand and he tried to shake this young fellow's hand with the pen in his hand and really didn't give him the time of day. And, and, and the thing is, needless to say, this young fella didn't even want to work there after all this. So this is why I say, you know, if, if, if we want to bring somebody, we've got to take the time to be with them and, and show them some respect because, um, you know, we, we can lose them pretty quickly. You know, as far as retaining people, uh, I, I really believe that a lot of us were just looking for some place to belong. You know, we just want to belong to something. And of course, if we want our people to be loyal, we have to be loyal first. And for some reason today, you know, as leaders, we we we, we struggle with doing that. Uh, I, I think there isn't a person, I think everybody today is on social media. You know, there, there's all different types of social media. I put down six here. Uh, I've only a few of these that I'm on, but but the interesting thing is, is that, you know, a lot of us, when we post something on social media, you know, the first thing we do is we go back and look for the likes. So, of course, you know, we have to show people that we care about them. You know, we have to thank them for showing up for work. And as crazy as it sounds, you know, that was unheard of 20 years ago when we had to thank somebody for showing up for work. I, I was working at another, actually, I work with four different precast plants, so it's, uh, now, that being said, um, you know, I get to work with a lot of precast people. And I was at a precast plant one day, and I mentioned to this one gentleman, and this guy's a rock star. Like, I'm not saying anything negative about him. He's a rock star. This guy can be the plant manager. A young guy, I think he's like maybe 31 or 32. And I had suggested to him, I said, you know, one of the things that we have to do is when we have a big day and people stick around, we get everything done we had to do. There's nothing wrong with walking around thanking them for showing up for work. And I said, hey, thank, tell them they did a good job. Like, tell them they're appreciated. And what was interesting is that he, we were in a group here. This was not a one-on-one. -on -one. We were in a group. And he said to me, he said, I don't believe that. He says, uh, they show up for their paycheck. I shouldn't have to thank them. Uh, you know, and he's, they're only here for the pay. So I just casually asked him, and I, I knew the answer to the question. And I said, I'm not here to, to, to embarrass you. But I said, I just want to ask you the question. Um, you're married, correct? He said, oh, yeah, I'm married. So I said, did you happen to mention to your wife the day that you got married that you loved her? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, like, have you told her since? He said, of course I have. So I said, why would you do that? To bring home a paycheck. You know, and, and I kind of caught him off guard. And, and I think ever since then, he's, uh, you know, he, he's literally changed his outlook on, on thanking people. You know, we got to be continually thanking them, you know, for being there. And, and it's something we never had to do, we'll say, many years ago. One of the things I started doing lately, I started asking this question because I think there's a lot of merit to it, is that 
do you feel you have a job or do you feel you have a career? And the interesting thing is, is the people that think they have a career, they tend to be more company minded, more future minded. And, and some of this will say, if they think they want to get a job, I'm not so certain we're doing a good job of doing the messaging to explain to them that they've got a career here. And one of the things that I say to groups every time I get working with them is, I don't know if, if you recognize this or not, but you're professionals. In order, you know, you've got more skills, in my opinion, than a hockey player. And I honestly mean that, you know, they're, they're, they're professionals of what they do. And I think we have to tell them that. And, you know, the thing is, is that let's just say our messaging is very, very important. Uh, you know, and the thing is, I just want to point something out. I think it's it, it's quite true is that I heard this, listen to an audio book that, you know, 26 is the new 18. You know, so let's just say when I was 18, you know, I, I wanted a car and all this and that. And, and now, you know, where I was at 18, it seems like people are 26 the day before they want that same thing. So for what it's worth, I thought I'd throw that out because I think it's a very important point. I just, I want to throw something in here that, you know, we've, um, I just want to jump the gun here, but, you know, we very rarely ever quit a job. We usually quit the leader. You know, it's been proven time and time again, you know, at least seven, sometimes eight cases out of 10, we will quit, uh, you know, the leader, we don't quit the company. And, and it's the same difference. Like I've got, you know, I'm sure everybody, we've all got friends that are divorced. I've, I've never had a friend yet that got divorced because they didn't like the kitchen. You know, they usually didn't get along with their partner. And it's the same thing with on the job. And of course, in order to keep people, in order to attract people, I can't emphasize enough, we have to be more attractable. Uh, this is one of the, you know, I think one of the greatest books ever wrote on leadership. It's called The Leadership Challenges. You know, this book was first published in 1987. It, um, you know, th there's 30 years of research has gone into this book. And, and of course, you know, there's 2 million copies sold. And, and there, there were some, what to call, in this book, they literally went all around the world and they checked every different industry and they've wanted to see what were these, you know, what were the exemplary practices that, that people will, you know, what do we look for in a leader? And, and the thing is, is the first thing we you know that's important is we have to model the way. You know, I, 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 the easiest way to kind of back this, back this one up is that people do what people see. You know, if I show up for work every day on time, you know, with my work boots tied uh, and my safety, you know, all the PPE on, guess what? You know, the people on my team are going to do that. But if I show up late, you know, the people on the team are going to show up late. So it's so important. The first thing that we look for in a leader is to model a way. And of course, we all, again, like I said earlier, you know, the best people want to work for the best companies. So we have to make sure that we model the way, you know, to the best of our ability. And the second thing, we have to inspire a shared vision. Uh, you know, and uh, if you look around the world today, I really believe that's one of the biggest things that we're missing in the world. When was the last time that you heard that, you know, we're going to make a better country, a better province, whatever? You know, I, I'm really, you know, I think that there's a, a spark of hope in Alberta from what I'm seeing. Uh, you know, that being said, we have to inspire a vision on the job site. You know, we need to be able to, you know, share a story with somebody, say, look, we're here today. But tomorrow, I need you, we're going to see you over here, and we're going to teach you how to run a crane. We're going to teach you how to run a forklift. You know, you, you stick around here. We're going to invest in you because we want you to stick around for a long time. Um, now, the third, of course, is we're going to be able to challenge the process. And, and that's as simple as, you know, one of the easiest ways to do this is when you ask somebody new, when they first come in, Say, look, what could we have done differently, you know, to make your onboarding better? What could we have done to make your first week on the job better? You'd be surprised how I quite often, when I'm working with some of these companies, I'll go out and I'll talk with them, you know, I'll literally put on the hard hat and the work boots and walk around the job sites. So I'll ask them, hey, look, you know, what, what's, what could they have done differently? And you'd be surprised with what they will tell me. And not only that, is it, you know, let's just say we all, I just went to a leadership conference here a week or two ago. And after the leadership conference, they actually sent me a survey. And one of the questions in the survey was, where did you hear about us? Why can't we ask the same question to the people that come to apply to work at our companies? Where did you hear about us? 
You know, I, I was one of the things I like to do when I work with companies, I ask the people, what are you grateful for? Because you're never going to be happy till you learn to be grateful. And one of the gentlemen the other day shared, hey, look, we've got a whole bunch of new people starting and I'm just grateful that we got new people coming. So I said, well, where are these people coming from? Do you know? He said, no clue. But you see, this is what you need to learn. Where are they coming from? Because if you don't know what's working when it's fixed, when it's working, how are you going to know to fix it when it breaks? You know, the the the, the fourth and of course is enable others to act. Let them, you know, let them do something on their own. Uh, you know, let, none of us want to be soldiers and just follow along. We're able to make, make the place better. And of course, we have to encourage the heart. Uh, you know, not very often we're real good at encouraging people. Uh, one of the things that I've seen is that you know people typically will live up to our um, you know our expectations, and you know I, I certainly live up to the expectations that people put on me. At least I try my best to. And the thing is, you know, we'd rather see a sermon than hear one. And you know, I, I think it was well too. You know, we, we need models, not critics. And sometimes that can be a bit of a challenging one. You know, nothing will kill. Uh, a great employee faster than watching you tolerate a bad one. And, you know, we've seen this all the time. Uh, I, I just want to share a story with you. Years ago, we, we had a gentleman who was very influential, we'll say, on the crew that I was a foreman over. And he started to show up for late work all the time. And it was, um, you know, when there's like, I think at that time, it was like 15 people on the crew. When one didn't show up, it really threw a wrench into the rest of the crew. And I, I remember, uh, you know, I, I had a decision to make to, to, to terminate this gentleman. I'd give him warnings and whatnot. And so, and I just want to emphasize too, this gentleman was very influential in the crew. Everybody looked up to him. He was very, um, you know, very vocal. And of course, he was the one that everybody watched. So I, I got to the point where I had to terminate him. So he showed up for work. I would say it was like 8.30 or 9 o'clock. He was supposed to be there at 6. And I said, I'm sorry, but I, I have to let you go. And the amazing thing was, is that he was, I was ups, more upset than he was. He didn't really seem to care. But at lunchtime, I went to go talk to one of his friends, just to mention to him that, hey, look, I just, you know, I had to terminate your friend. And the first thing he said to me was, what took you so effing long? So, you know, and so like I said, I, I never forgot that lesson. You know, I was tolerating this and the rest of the crew, you know, was not happy, of course, that I was tolerating it. And the funny thing is, is, you know, we judge ourselves on our intentions. Others judge us on our actions. I, I, I do some work for this company, so I, I, I take a picture. I thought it was very fitting, but I, I run by this house all the time. And I seen this, there's actually two bags of top sale there. And that was in early spring when they were delivered. And you can see by this picture that you know, they sat there for a long time. And, and the reason I point this out is that, you know, we judge ourselves on our intentions. Others judge us on our actions. You know, nobody feels your intentions. You know, they only feel your actions. I, I just want to point out, you know, the, the top five reasons why we typically leave a company, and these are the top five, is not being treated with respect and dignity is the first one, uh, being prevented from making an impact. You know, young people, like I, I know even today still, I'm kind of, you know, I, I want to go in and help companies. And if I go in there and I see I can't help, I lose steam pretty quick. And, and young people in particular, they want to get in, they want to change the world. And, and if we don't let them be part of that, you know, we can discourage them pretty quickly. <laughs> Of course, not being listened to, you know, it, 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 lots of times, you know, we have good ideas. And of course, if we're not being listened to, it, it, it certainly backfires on us. You know, not being rewarded with enough responsibility. And 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 the fifth one is money. I just want to share a quick story. I, do, uh, I did some work with this one construction company, and they said that they had a hard time uh, attracting and retaining people because they were based at a Sudbury. And the mines paid so much more than what they did. And then that, that it was a real issue. So we did this little exercise called these value cards. I think I've got like, I think it's 30 or 40 cards. So you pick up your different values. And there was, I want to say, 25 people in the group. And not one of the people in the group picked money as one of their values. So I, not everybody sticks around for money. And the thing is, is, you know, uh, you know, I, I really believe that, you know, People respond to what we talk about. 
I, I, I certainly want to encourage you know every company, uh, every team to take what you call a class picture and, and have a goal of not losing anybody on the team. Because you got to remember, goals unify a team. You know, when you set a goal that, hey, you know, nobody's going to leave, you know, th- th- this year or whatever. We want to have the same group at Christmas. It gives, you know, it gives people something to talk about. And you can set that same goal where, you know, we're going to make sure that we recruit somebody this month. We're going to, as a team, we're going to make it a point to recruit one person. Because you got to remember what you focus on grows. And if people keep talking about it, it's certainly going to go a long ways. And, and it's amazing how fast we can learn how to dance when somebody's shooting at our feet. Um, I, I'm a very firm believer that, did you know, a happy cow gives more milk and the, the, they're, not, they're not going to leave the team if they're happy. We have to do everything we can to make sure that they stay happy. Uh, you know, I just I want to kind of focus on this a little bit. You know, people respond to what we talk about. And not only that is that we typically cannot think of two things at the same time. And and I hope everybody can see this. It's a picture of a peanut butter pasta parfait. And I just, I don't want you to think about that chocolate at the bottom of it. And if you look at the bottom, there's there's a couple of peanuts in the chocolate at the bottom. I don't want you looking at that and, and, and don't notice the ice cream that fills up the bottom and then another layer of chocolate and then another, you know, more bit more ice cream, and more chocolate and see the peanuts on top. I don't want you looking at that. But, but you'll notice as I'm talking about it, it's impossible for you to not think about it. And the thing is, we have that same ability with the people on the job. You know, I think it's safe to say that, you know, everything rises and falls on leadership. Like I said earlier, we don't quit jobs. We quit leaders. You know, we don't want to have jobs as leaders. We have responsibilities. And the thing is, you know, if we want to keep what we have, we have to give it away. You know, we follow confident leaders and we are at a position now in, I think, a lot of industries where I, I never thought I'd say this, but our vehicles are now outlasting our employees. You know, it's not uncommon to have a vehicle that lasts 10 or 12 years, and you get vehicles that are people that last three, four, five years, sometimes if we're lucky. So we just we want to be aware of that. Uh, you know, 90% of businesses fail because they stopped doing what made them successful in the first place. And the reason I bring that up is that Quite often, we bring somebody on the job, we hire them, you know, we pay attention to them for the first couple of weeks, and then we tend to forget about them. You know, we get busy, and, and we don't have the time to spend with them that we did at the very start. And, and of course, that, that catches up with us. And it, 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 again, you can replace that same thing. You know, 90% of marriages fail because they stopped doing what made them successful in the first place. I, 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 one of my favorite sayings is, you know, everyone wins when the leader gets better. You know, if you want to retain people, the leaders have to become better. There's no other way of putting it. You know, the leaders have to become better. So, of course, as you know, and the thing is, the truth is, is the best leaders are the best learners. You know, I, I see it all the time where, you know, I go into companies and they're, they're very rarely do I work in a company where we don't start a company library and we have audio books sometimes books on cd or dvd we pass out or, or, or hardcover books and, and we show that hey look at this if you come work here you know we're serious about investing in you so you'll have a good future here you know i i, I dare you to be the leader i'll never forget uh for what it's worth you, you can follow me on instagram it, it's just mark.nesbit and uh, we're going to have a bit of a q a session here I when I first talked to Dan, I mentioned to him that I was going to put my email here only because if you're like me, you might not want to ask a question in front of a group. And that's how I am. I sometimes don't like asking questions where I might look silly. So that being said, if you have any questions, uh, by all means, do not be afraid to uh, reach out. Uh, you can see it. it it's, it's mark at nesbittraining.ca. It's kind of weird because there's three T's there, but please feel free to reach out. And if you've got any questions, and I'll do my absolute best to try and answer them. So uh, unfortunately, we only had 45 minutes today. Uh, you know, quite often I work with companies for you know days and weeks at a time. And, you know, sometimes 45 minutes, I don't get to share everything I'd like to. Uh, but nevertheless, I hopefully, you know, we, we have gained something here that you can use uh, going forward. So I guess I will stop sharing now. And we'll have a kind of a Q&A session.
Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was um, that was great. And I know uh, I know a lot from my personal perspective. I know a lot of what you talked about resonated for sure with what uh, conversations I have with with members of, of Concrete Alberta. You know, as as an association, we're looking at you know what more can we do on on social media to um, attract folks to to the industry. Um, we're looking at ways we can engage with school age. Uh, individuals, whether it be you know junior high or maybe even even younger, at ways we can uh, attract them and get their interest in in the con, um, concrete industry. Um, so yes, thank you so much. Very um, much of what you said definitely resonated and uh, and and was valuable. Um, we do have one question uh, so far in the in the chat from from Andrea. Uh, Andrea would would love to know. Mark's view on the top mistakes that uh, Mark, you see supervisors make with their their people or, or crews. The top the top mistake they make. Yeah, top mistake um, you, that you see supervisors make with their people or their crews. That, that's a great question. Because there's obviously a lot of them. I, I want to emphasize as much as I can with, with people. The small things are the big things. I, I know there's one place in particular that I go to, and I'm not here to knock any company or any person, okay? Because let, let's face it, COVID is completely, forgive me for saying this, but I think it's ruined almost every business in Canada in the sense that they're all shorthanded. And then because the shorthanded, the leader is now doing the job of two people because somebody didn't show up for work today. And it, 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 it happens everywhere I go. But that kind of what does it, it it's almost like compound interest. It's like a snowball. So what happens is the leaders get so busy that they don't take time to recognize the people. You would be surprised how important smiling at somebody is, saying good morning to them is, because you got to remember, as leaders, we go first. It is our job to walk around, say good morning to everybody, make sure that they're here and they're happy, and then go about your day. So if there's one thing that I see in particular is that we forget that we've got actually people that are real live human beings and emotions trump logic like we gotta hit them on the emotional side that's great emotions trump log logic absolutely thank you uh thank you mark um any other other questions for for mark well i have one while uh others think of um something else mark you gave uh, an example uh from sudbury on on mines um and how um, there was a perception or feeling that there was a larger carrot coming from the, the mining industry that was pulling workers to to that uh, to that industry. You know, our, our industry here in Alberta definitely uh, competes with with other industries for a talent pool, a specific talent pool in, in Alberta. That's oil and gas industry, and they're um, when they're firing on all cylinders, their their carrot is usually quite a bit bigger than ours when it comes to uh, the wage side side of things. So, do you have any advice or, or perspective on on how you know our industry in, in Alberta could uh, could do a better job of, of competing with uh, with others who, when we're we're going after the same same labor pool, but uh, maybe not able to uh, to meet the same level of of wage expectations or wage uh, wage advertisement. Well, I'll try to answer this the best I can. That, that's a, obviously a common thing. Yeah. I think I mentioned you when we had our Zoom call down in Ottawa, for example, if you work at a precast plant in Ottawa and you leave the precast plant in Ottawa to go work on this LRT to the building here, it's like an 8 or $9 an hour increase in pay to work outside compared to inside a plant. And that's, you know, to some people, that's a lot of money. And I'm not saying it's not. But, but the thing is, is that, what kind of somewhat baffles me, and maybe I'm old school here, but we, we've got people that work for us who they say money's everything, but they don't know enough to save 10%. You know, so if we could show them, hey, look, could you work here? You save some money, you've got a good career, and you're going to have a good life. But but I think one of the things that I ask this question all the time when I work with a group, uh, usually it's one of the first questions I ask, is there one person in your life who you can say has just done everything for you, has been there for you, just you know, has always there for you. 
And, and some people will say, like myself will say, it's my wife. You know, some people say it's their mom, it's their dad. And then, of course, you ask the question, well, then if that person, since they were so good to you, what would you do for them? And then you, most people say, well, I'd do anything for them. And, of course, that right there is the essence of leadership. And this is why, you know, as leaders, we have to go first. You know, we have to make sure and treat our people with respect, show them that this is where, you know, they've got a career here, they've got a future here. You know, we're never going to, you know, it's, you know, we all know, you know, the, what's that, 25, 50, 25 rule. There's going to be 25, we're going to, 25% are going to listen to you no matter what. You know, 50% are always going to be on the fence and there's going to be 25% that aren't going to listen to you no matter what. So our jobs as leaders is to keep that 25% away, you know, who aren't going to listen to us, keep them away from the 50% on the fence. And the 25% that are going to, you know, that are say is on our side, you know, give them a voice to kind of share with the other group and try to persuade them, you know, to stick around. And this is why, again, it's a one-on-one time, that personal time. Every company has a sales team. Well, at least most companies have a sales team. And, and they're out there actively selling the product, you know, they're taking customers for lunch. Yet, where do you see, a, you know, where do we see the team selling the company to come work here? You know, when was the last time you took somebody up for lunch on your team? You know, like it, it's if, if we can just kind of think sales, you know, and, and flip the way we think, I, I think would go a long ways. And unfortunately, again, we're so busy and we're trying to do the job that we just don't take the time. Oh, thank you. Well said, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, we got one more question. Um, well, we do have a, a bit more time. If there's other questions, uh, get them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, but uh, Andrea is asking, when it comes to retention, how important is it to create a sense of family or community? It's very important. Like I said, we all want a sense of belonging. And a, a classic example is Peter Drucker says, you know, we have to learn how to treat employees like volunteers. I know in my neighborhood in the wintertime, you'll see people out knocking on the doors for heart and stroke or cancer when it's 20 below trying to collect money. They're not getting paid to do that. It's because they feel like they belong to something big. And this is where, you know, our jobs as leaders, we have to create that sense that we're doing something great because we are. Like I, I often mention, you know, because I, I work with enough precast plants that, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, they're just not making pipe. They're cleaning up the environment. If it wasn't for these concrete pipes going underground, where would all the dirty water go? You know, and that's just one of the things at the top. We're doing something great here. And, you know, I'll give you an example. When we start putting people ahead of the product, the product will get made by itself. And that's just something that we've got to think of. Hey, look, we've got to put our people first and invest in them and train them and show them that we want them here. Well, I'll give you an example. Almost This happened to me, for example. I spent 25 years at one company. And this company I worked at, I'm not here to say anything negative about them, but they were not good at giving praise. And I remember the first time I was put into a leadership training, you know, any training of any kind, I I, I felt like that the turn to switch on that the company cared about me because they were investing in me. So I can't emphasize enough how, you know, investing in the team is so powerful. And I, again, if you think you're going to keep 100, percent it's just not going to happen. You know, just let's just worry about the good ones. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, well, I do appreciate uh, your time today, Mark. Again, very informative and insightful uh, presentation. As noted by one of our participants, there's tons of of great information that they're going to be sharing with their their leadership team. So. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank you to our our participants. And uh, folks, please uh, be sure to register for our next Talent Tuesdays uh, webinar. So thank you very much, all. And and please have have a great day. Thank you. Thanks for being here, people.